Health, psychology, and human nature with Andre Stureson. Hey friends, hope you're having a great day. Are you following me on Instagram and Facebook? Please go to Health, Psychology and Human Nature on Instagram or Facebook or both for that matter to get the latest episodes, inspiration and more. Please take a pause and go there. Also, if you like the episode, please share it with a friend, family member or somebody else who you think might like it. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Health, Psychology and Human Nature with Andrea Stureson, a science-focused podcast where we explore, learn and improve our lives together. In today's interesting episode, you will learn a lot about obsessive-compulsive disorder, OCD for short and also the most effective treatment named Exposure and Response Prevention, ERP. Doing what you fear without the compulsion, that is the hallmark of ERP. We'll also get into toxifying and detoxifying ways to relate to your thoughts, something that is helpful for all of us. Dr. David A. Clark, he's a professor emeritus and a clinical psychologist who got trained by no other than Aaron T. Beck, the father of cognitive therapy. His research, it focuses on vulnerability, cognitive factors, assessment and treatment of depression and anxiety, and especially obsessive compulsive disorder. And he has written numerous books and scientific publications. Friends, Please enjoy. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Have you um, have you been out water skiing lately? Uh, not water skiing, although I could actually water ski where I am at the moment. R- right. Where are you right now? I'm in Boca Raton, Florida. <laughs> I'm so jealous of you. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice here. Hot and sunny. Yeah, that's 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 how we want it. Over here, it's it's about two degrees. It's dark and it's windy. Oh, sounds a bit like Canada right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm really looking forward to the conversation uh, today, and um, we're going to talk about uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Okay. And uh, I would just like to just start off by asking you if you could, in a pedagogical way, just explain what obsessive compulsive obsessive compulsive disorder is. Sure, be happy to do that. Um, you know, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, as the term or the name, the label uh, implies, it's uh, when an individual has obsessions and compulsions. Now, you don't actually have to have both in order to meet the diagnostic criteria for OCD. However, the vast majority, probably 90% of people have both obsessions and compulsions. So, of course, the critical thing is, what do we mean by obsessions? And obsessions are recurring, unwanted thoughts images or urges or impulses that are uh, that intrude into the mind so it's not like you're trying to think or imagine things in a certain way these repetitive thoughts or images are highly distressing to the individual they often really don't want to have these thoughts in their mind and they often try hard not to think about the the thought. So, for example, an obsession might be a very simple one might be, did I lock the door to my apartment or condo when I left? Let's say, did I lock the door? Did I turn off the gas to the stove? Did I turn off the light switches and so on? So you have this doubt, this thought, did I do this? 
that would be uh, an example of an obsession. And let's say the thought keeps coming back into your mind over and over again. And the more you have the thought, the more anxious and upset you become. And so what would be the logical thing to do if you had such a thought? Well, you would say, I would go back and I would check to see, did I shut the uh, knobs on the stove off? Did I turn the lights off? Did I turn the heat down? Did I lock the door? So you would be checking, right? Right. And that would be the compulsive side. Now, what happens in OCD is the person has, let's say, the thought of, did I lock the door or did I turn off the stove? They then go back and check, but the checking causes them to doubt even more. So they might check it and they go, okay, that's good enough. But then they uh, walk away and in a few seconds the thought comes back, well, did I really check that well enough? Maybe the stove really is still on. And so then they go back and check again. And so what happens is you get into these multiple uh, uh, times of checking and uh, some people get caught into this cycle for hours, not just a few minutes, but they can get caught into these cycles for hours on end. So they have the obsession, a distressing thought, and it's recurring, it's upsetting, and they can't get it out of their mind. So the solution is to perform some compulsion. Right. So, so what was it again? It was thoughts, images, or impulses or impulses could you could you perhaps give like an example of each so so it becomes really clear for us that don't really know a lot about this right so let's say i've just given you an example of recurring thought let's say that pops into your mind like did i did i turn the stove off or did i uh lock the door but you could have an image uh, um, an, an image that pops into your mind so if, let's say for example you're driving in your car you're driving down the street and you pass a cyclist on the road and you have the thought an image sorry excuse me an image pop into your mind of running over the cyclist Right. So this is disturbing. Most of us don't like to run over cyclists when we're driving. And uh, and so this is a very disturbing image for you. Now, in most cases, if you've ever had that thought, you go, oh, well, that's silly. Maybe you look in your rearview mirror, you, you know, you see the cycle and you go on. But let's say you drive on and that image of having hit the cyclist stays in your mind. You might then, you see, say, okay, I better go back and check. Mm -hmm. Is there a cyclist on the side of the road injured or maybe in the ditch somewhere? And uh, maybe they've been taken to the hospital, you know, and so on. So you could, that would be an example of an image, an obsessive image. Right. Um, and then uh, an impulse might be, a, here's a great example, uh, because I've experienced this myself, which is, let's say you're at, <clears throat> excuse me, you're at a train station, right? And you're standing near the platform, towards, towards the edge of the platform. Have you ever had that urge to throw yourself onto the platform, let's say, in front of a train, right? Yeah, right. Now, you're not suicidal, you like your life, you don't want to end your life, you're not depressed in any way, but there's just this urge comes over you uh, and, you know, of throwing yourself in front of the train, mm. right? And so maybe you step back on the platform from the edge of the platform because you think, wow, where did that come from? I don't, I don't want to do that. And yet it just you can feel it. Uh, another example of that would be if you've ever been on a balcony, let's say, in a high rise, let's say you're 20 or 30 stories in the air, you're in a balcony and there's a railing around it. Have you ever taken a hold of the railing and looked down over like 30 stories down? Yeah. Right. And you get this kind of weakness come over you like your knees can start to shake and feel weak and so on. And it's kind of either an image of throwing yourself over the railing, 
and you can imagine yourself dropping, you know, several meters, you know, dozens or tens of meters, let's say, down and hitting the ground. And that would be the image or just this impulse of jumping over the railing. And it, so, so these are the kinds of things that that you could call these are urges, let's say, and they become an obsession if time and time again you had this kind of feeling and then it scared you and you started to perform compulsions, let's say, to uh, to deal with it. Right. So so that could be like you every time when you are at the railway station, you get these impulses and and then you get more and more of them. And to to calm yourself, you do something to to handle the situation. Exactly. Now, in that case where let's say you have that obsessive urge to jump in front of a train, my guess is probably what you would do is you would start avoiding train stations. Mm. You would say to your family and friends, well, I can't take the train anymore. Right. And so you could see where, uh, and this, it frequently happens in OCD, where it's not just the person has the obsession and then performs some compulsion like washing or checking or saying magical phrases to themselves. These are the compulsions that are most common, but they may also start avoiding anything that would trigger the obsession. So so it's a lot so it has a lot to do with having intrusive thoughts, images, urges, and then it's a lot of anxiety and other emotions tied to these images, thoughts and and uh, urges, right? Right. So let me go through some of the examples of the types of thoughts and images that can become obsessive for people. And these are the most common types. So uh, I've already mentioned people having obsessive doubts yeah. about their actions, you know, driving, leaving the house or their apartment that sort of thing. So those are obsessive doubts that lead to checking. And then there are people, many people have obsessions about disease, dirt, and contamination. So if they touch anything that is um, that other people have touched, let's say uh, uh, doorknobs, uh, the uh, handles on doors in public buildings, hand railings, using uh, public uh, restrooms or toilets, uh, anything where you have other people handling things. Some, some people I've treated, they couldn't sit on chairs mm -hmm. where other people have sat on these chairs and so on. Because the thought that they have is, oh, maybe I could get contaminated. I could, th 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 this is dirty. And the fear is, of course, some terrible disease like cancer or some uh, sexually transmitted disease. Uh, and uh, often then they, the, the fear is that they will become diseased or the fear is that they will somehow transmit the disease to other people. Ah, right. And then they will be responsible for infecting other people. And so when you have these thoughts of contamination, physical contamination, disease, dirt, contamination, then people will wash repeatedly. And that's the compulsion. So they'll wash their hands over and over again. Sometimes you get people who are washing their hands dozens of times a day to the point where, you know, the, the skin and the hands are, you know, are kind of blistered, dry and bleeding and cracked and so on. Or they'll spend hours showering or laundering their clothes right. for fear of contamination. Yeah. yeah. So, so those are the two main types, the uh, uh, obsessions about dirt, disease, contamination, and, and, and doubts. But then there are other types of obsessions. People can have obsessions about accidentally causing harm or injury to other people. So, for example, I, I, I gave you the example of the driver, you know, did I hit the cyclist. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, people will have doubts, you know, will I lose control and, you know, push an elderly person down or, you know, uh, often parents will have 
the thought of when they're cutting up vegetables, let's say, with a knife in the kitchen, of losing control and stabbing their children. Right. At, or stabbing someone else. And uh, maybe it could be their partner or anyone who's in the kitchen with them. Uh, or, you know, sometimes uh, uh, parents, when they're, you know, they're, they have their babies or, or, or toddlers or whatever in a stroller, um, you know, the thought of maybe pushing the stroller down a flight of stairs. So these are thoughts that pop into your mind. They could be images uh, or they could be actual thoughts. And of course, it's very, very horrifying. You don't want to do this. Um, and so the thought causes a lot of anxiety and distress and guilt. Um, then we have, so these are the, uh, and sometimes I've had patients who have worried that maybe they've poisoned somebody with food. And so let's say they've cooked a meal. Uh, I've had a number of, of people who are, uh, are fearful of cross contamination. So if they're working, you know, cooking raw meat, for example, they'll be washing their hands compulsively because they're uh, frightened of cross contamination from the, the raw meat to, let's say, the vegetables and so on. And so they will then get become quite obsessive about that. So that would all be examples of causing uh, accidental harm to other people. So that's a type of obsession. There are also some sexual obsessions. Uh, some people will have the thoughts of uh, uh, pedophile type of thoughts, you know, and, and that would be, you know, uh, am I somehow capable of losing control and causing harm to a child sexually, sexually molesting a child, or maybe they've been around children and they've, th they've thought, they've had the thought, did I touch that child inappropriately? Right. Or when I touched the child, let's say held the child, did I become sexually aroused? And so then you get these obsessions around that. Uh, the other ones are you can sometimes get um, sexual orientation obsessions where a person who is, um, let's say they're heterosexual and they have the thought, was I sexually aroused by someone of the same sex? And th they get very anxious about that and very distressed. And so then they become obsessed about that, obsessive about that. Right. So there are these different types of obsessions that people have. And then occasionally I have people, we have people who have more, you can have uh, what we call somatic obsessions. You can have religious obsessions where you have this thought of whether uh, you are going to be punished by God or a higher being, whether you have uh, confessed all your sins, whether you have prayed well enough. Uh, and so we, you know, so there are people who have we call religious obsessions. Yeah. And it seems like a lot of this has has to do with, uh, yeah, with feeling these uh, these emotions or wanting to not feel those these emotions like anxiety and other things is that is that like an underlying cause or what what do you have to say about that right so you know if you have first of all what we do know from our, our most recent research is that we all have thoughts that are very similar to obsessions yeah so we've all had as i maybe as i've gone through this list of potential obsessions Maybe you, as a listener, you thought, well, I've had that thought, you know, I've had that thought pop into my mind or I've had that question and yet it hasn't bothered you, right? You know, you kind of just dismiss it right. as, as irrelevant or maybe even a silly thought or doesn't make any sense, you say, and then you just continue on. For somebody with OCD, of course, they pay a great deal of attention to these thoughts because it makes them, they're upset. They're feeling anxious. They're feeling distress. They feel guilt uh, about the thoughts. And so because they're emotionally charged, they end up paying a lot of attention to them. Yeah. I think it would be interesting also to, uh, to get into... Um how you how you treat OCD so so from my understanding and also I saw that you wrote that exposure and response prevention is still the 
the best empiric- empirically supported treatment for OCD. Is, is that is that correct or? Yes, and it still seems to be the case. I mean, we can trace uh, the history uh, of exposure and response prevention actually in the late se- late 60s, early 70s, 1970s, uh, was when this form of treatment was first um, proposed, was first uh, developed, let's say. Yeah. And the idea is this, is that the problem with uh, the person's, uh, person with OCD, so the problem is that as long as you respond to the obsession by doing a compulsion, let's say hand washing a lot or repeating, you know, checking a lot or avoiding Uh, Another thing is trying to reassure yourself or ask other people whether everything will be okay. So these kinds of responses, what we know is the more you do that in response to the obsession, the worse the obsession becomes. Mm, Okay. Okay. Right? So you kind of get caught in a trap because what happens is in the short term, it might work quite well. So, for example, if you take contamination, you feel contaminated, you wash your hands, you scrub yourself really well, let's say, and you think you feel you feel better. You feel, okay. I think I'm clean. There's no dessert, no disease. There's no dirt and so on. And you and you leave. You you get dressed and you go. But within a short period of time, sometimes only in a matter of minutes, then the thought of either well, did I really clean all parts of my body really well? Or then, you know, you touch something else and immediately you start thinking that you're dirty and contaminated again. And so then you have to start washing all over again. So what we know is that when people engage in these compulsions and the avoidance is that it makes the obsession worse, more frequent and more distressing. So the idea between exposure and response prevention is what if you exposed people to the thing that they fear, in other words, whatever it is that's triggering their obsession, and then they were to prevent themselves from washing, Mm. right? So it's a very simple idea. And the idea is, of course, is that you will feel intense anxiety. So let's take a physical contamination. And let's say the person says, well, I cannot use um, a toilet that other people have used. Okay, so let's say the exposure part would be to have the person touch a toilet that other people use, let's say. Maybe other family members use it or friends or you might even take them to a public toilet or whatever. Right. Yeah. And so then they use it. They get, they feel distressed by this because now they've got the thoughts of contamination, but they don't wash, Hmm. right? The anxiety will go up really high at first, but if they persist over 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, and they don't wash, eventually the anxiety will drop. Right, so it, so it's it's exposing yourself for whatever you whatever you don't like, and then by not doing the yeah the behavior, then you learn or some or the, yeah then you don't feel or then then the anxiety goes away by itself, kind of. It kind of drops by itself. Yeah, and and you know it's the idea. Remember, I don't know if this phrase makes any sense to you, but we always used to have a phrase that if you fell off the horse, you know, the thing to do is to get back on it and ride. Yeah. And that if you, if you fell off the horse and you didn't get back on the horse, you become frightened of riding a horse. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, this, this is the kind of thing, although most of us don't ride horses this day and age, do we? <laughs> no. But, <laughs> yeah, but, so maybe we need a different example for that. Right. Uh, But any kind of fear, if you think about it, any fear that you develop, if you have a fear of flying, let's say, well, what do you need to do? Well, you need to fly, right? You need to 
face that fear. And so that's what you're doing in OCD. You're facing the fear because remember, the fear in OCD is a fear of a thought. Yeah. The person isn't really dirty and contaminated. I mean, you know, we're all contaminated to a certain degree. Yeah. yeah. Right? Right? We can't be, we're all contaminated to a certain degree. That's why we have an immune system and so on. And so, but so the problem is the person has the thought, what if I'm contaminated? That's a scary, frightening thought for them. And so they neutralize that fear by doing the compulsion. So in OCD, it's exposing yourself to the fear, just like you would do in any fear or phobia. But then the second component is you must not do the compulsion, because if you do the compulsion, then it's going to neutralize the fear. Right. And you'll never learn to overcome the fear. Right. And But it's a fear of the thought. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a fear of the so, thought. So that is kind of the root. How, like, uh, when, when, when somebody comes uh, for treatment and goes into this e ERP treatment, like, how long time usually do you have to... Do you have to expose yourself for these two for them to well Andre, that's that, that i mean that's a great question because um I and mean, i wish i could give you a great answer to <laughs> yeah <that. laughs> i'm afraid i can't yeah. because it varies greatly okay i mean if you look at the uh, treatment literature on exposure and response prevention usually it's somewhere between 15 20 sessions uh, you know, for somebody who has a very significant, let's say, very severe, long-lasting OCD. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, but I have seen people who needed many more sessions than that, and I've seen people who ha need f many fewer sessions. So sometimes you can get fairly rapid gains. The, the problem is most people dislike this treatment tremendously yeah, it's kind of imagine. like a bitter yeah. it's a bitter medicine in fact i've had some patients say to me you know they they've read up on you know they've googled exposure and response prevention and they'll say i know this is the most effective treatment but i really don't want to do it is <laughs> yeah. there any other possible way yeah. can i take some vacation can i do some other kind of therapy i really don't want to do this but in the end, um, you know, you have to get to the point where you're not frightened of your thoughts. And um, and and so however you get there, um, you know, what I tell people is that the quickest way to get there is through exposure and response prevention. Yeah. OK. But 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 why does it work then? Like I I I I read something about habituation and what but or what would you say why why does it work? So we used to think it was something called habituation. And what habituation is, let's say you go into a room and you smell something very bad, a very foul odor. Yeah. Right? Within a few minutes, right? the odor is not nearly as foul as when you first enter the room. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you kind of get our sensory, olfactory sensory, we, we call it, we habituate, we get used to it. We Somehow the intensity of the odor decreases. The same way with sound. It, those of you, uh, well, I remember my day, I'm a bit older, we used to go to rock concerts. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, your first, your, that first couple of songs, it would just blow you out of your seat. But after a while, you start to get used to the, the, the high volume, let's say. And, and that's kind of what happens to people emotionally. Now, that's what we used to think, that it was that our emotions are a bit like sound and smell and so on, that you kind of get used to it and they just decline, habituate. It's, it's clear that's not quite right. We didn't have that explanation quite right and so now some there's some new research coming out places like uh, in Berkeley in, uh, in uh, sorry not Berkeley but UCLA in Los Angeles and so on where it seems like what's happening through exposure response prevention is a relearning process that seems to be what's happening in the brain whereby we have these fear structures this fear that's activated let's say by thoughts of I don't know, 
maybe being a pedophile or, you know, harming someone or being dirty and contaminated or whatever. So we have these fearful thoughts. But then what's happening through exposure response prevention is we're learning how to inhibit that fear. Hmm. So now the model is not uh, habituation, but it's thought it's inhibitory learning that's happening. Okay, okay so what does that mean? <laughs> so what that means is that let's take our physical contamination person again, because that's the easiest example. Yeah. Let's say, you know, you touch a hand railing in a public building and you get the thought, all these people who've touched this hand ra railing and some of them may be, you know, maybe they had some kind of skin disease or, you know, whatever. And, you know, so there's germs on the hand railing. You have that thought that now you've got germs on your hands. And what if you put your hands close to your mouth and the germs get into your mouth and into your body and now you're contaminated? So this is all you thinking and imagining that this is happening, right? Yeah. Uh, so in inhibitory learning through exposure and response prevention, what you're doing is saying, I'm not going to wash. I'm going to let my hand, I'm going to imagine my hands are still contaminated and dirty. Maybe I've touched my, uh, my face. Maybe, you know, I'm now contaminated. I'm just going to let it go. And what happens is you find out, well, soon you forget about it, right? It might take us several hours, but you then forget about the fact that you're contaminated and you touch the railing. And what you're learning is that that thought of contamination is inaccurate. Hmm. It's, you know, that it's maybe not as meaningful as what you were thinking, that clearly you're not sick. You haven't been rushed to the hospital because now you have some horrible disease because you've just touched a hand rate. So you're learning that when you get that thought and that emotion of, oh, maybe I'm contaminated, literally you can say, well, wait a minute now, I don't need, I, I, I can't trust that. I know that from my experience that this seems pretty safe thing to do. Millions of people touch hand railings. They don't all end up in the hospital. I haven't ended up in the hospital. So, you know, I guess I can't really trust that initial anxiety that I feel. Right. So you're learning, you're learning to inhibit that initial fear. Right. So, and, and you have to withstand the compulsion to be able to learn then. Right. And that is, if I, if I dare use this term, that is the trick to the whole therapy, which is helping people to, I'm going to use the term, hang in there, helping people to tolerate this level of distress. And so often, like in my work, I use some cognitive strategies to help people get through that exposure. Okay, interesting. So, yeah, so, so, so you learn that by not, when you're not doing your, your compulsions, then you learn that it's safe and that you will not be, and that you will not get the disease that you're afraid of and everything. Right. And so there's two types of learning that we can think of. There's kind of this verbal learning, which is as we're doing this podcast and maybe we have people listening to it and they're picking up some information about OCD. And if you have OCD or, you know, have a, a family member or a relative or friend with OCD. So as you're listening to this, you're learning some things about OCD. So that's verbal learning. Mm, yeah. We all do this in school, right? I mean, that's what education is all about verbal learning. And then there's experiential learning, which is the type which, you know, you go out and do it, right? You learn by doing. And so you can think of exposure and response prevention is kind of like experiential learning. You're learning from your own experience of, look, I thought I was contaminated. I certainly felt distressed and anxious. You know what? If I can just hold off for an hour or two hours, you know, it's true. I can get on with life. It's not as distressing. And I'm kind of learning that, you know what? Uh, I, I, I need to be more careful in terms of what thoughts I pay attention to. I can't believe everything I think. Right. Right. Yeah. 
I think it would be very interesting to uh, to take some some more like ordinary everyday examples and and talk about what what you're supposed to do or like the like uh, some some tips of how you can handle it. Right. So okay. So so the first one. Let's say if you have doubts. Let's say that you you have a, you have an intrusive thought that you forgot to turn off the stove. Let's say. And so, so what would be the best way to, to handle that if you get that every day and, and you want to, to handle that in a, in a good way? Okay. So let's say you, that, and that's a great example because it's a kind of a common one. So let's say you have the thought, did I turn the stove off? And let's say you're, you're out the door. You, you, you know, you've kind of left, you've put your coat on. You've got your purse, your briefcase, whatever, your shopping bags, and you've locked the door and you're on your way to your car, to the bus stop or wherever. And then the thought comes to you, oh, I can't remember. Did I, did I turn the stove off? Now, at that point, you have one of two options. One would be to ignore the thought and say, well, I've always turned the stove off and you keep going. You could have a rule that you say, I'm going to go back and I'm only going to check once. Yeah. Right? So let's say you go back, you open the door, you look at the knobs or, you know, you whatever, and you say, well, the stove's off. Then you go back out and let's say you still get the thought, well, did I really look hard? I mean, do I, maybe I wasn't, paying attention when I looked at the knobs, maybe the knob is off just by a millimeter or two and there's a burner that's really left on, but I didn't see it. At that point you say, no, I'm not going back. Hmm. Because some of the experiments that have been done with checking is the more you check, the more you doubt. That is interesting. And also, of course, I mean, it could be, I mean, it could be that you actually forgot. Exactly. But I mean, if you if you have it, if you have it every day, let's say, would you s- still would it? Yeah. Then it, then it's still good, perhaps, to have that rule. Yeah. So to go in and check and. Right, and if you have it every day, then clearly you know you're getting excessive because I suspect that not every day, you know, you're not going back, you know half three quarters of the time and finding that the stove has been left on and if you are doing that then you probably need to see your family doctor and see if there's some sort of a cognitive problem that you might have like maybe you're having some kind of a memory problem but you know it is possible i suppose yeah yeah for sure okay so 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 here it would be good to to have a rule to you get you get one shot to check if it's off and uh, and if you're still having those problems, then perhaps you should could check out if you're having memory problems. Or would you also suggest that, like, if if you do it every day, that you'll just not look and just go away? Or well, I mean, that's the other thing. Sometimes I'll say to ah, you know, I've had these thoughts. I leave the house and I think, oh, did I did I lock the door? And I will tell myself I will refuse to let myself go back and check. Yeah. Exactly. I won't even check once. Yeah, I'll just say no. Uh, that's an intru- what we call intrusive thought, and I'll say, okay. So what's the worst if I didn't lock the door? I'll say, okay. Well, the worst thing that could happen is I suppose somebody could break in and 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 rob me. Yeah. But then if somebody really wanted to rob me, they could do it very easily, whether the door is locked or not. Right. Right. So this is what I think. And uh, also I say, how many times have I've come back home and discovered that I forgot to lock the door? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe once in 40 years. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, then I tell myself, really, it's just not it's not healthy to go back and check. So, so I do use, and this is where, and I'd like to bring this up. It's not only exposure and response prevention now, but we also use cognitive strategies to help people take a different approach, different attitude towards their thoughts. Right. Their distressing thoughts. 
Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Right. Uh, yeah, so let's take an example. Some obsessions are not nearly as straightforward, let's say not as well um, anchored in the real world. Uh, some are fairly um, abstract thoughts. Yeah. So, for example, I've had religious people, uh, people uh, of the Christian faith, and the obsession is, what if I've displeased God and I'm condemned to hell? Yeah. Well, how do you check that one out? Yeah. Right? You're talking about, uh, first of all, what your belief is about life after death. And if, if you believe that there is life after death and there is a heaven and there is a hell, but even if you believe that, how do you check that? You can't possibly, there, there's, no, there's no way of doing exposure and response prevention in a sense to that. Yeah. There's at least no way to do the prevention side of it. So what, there's two things that we do here. One is, what is the problem? The problem is that the person is frightened of the thought, what if I'm condemned to hell? And for a moment you can say, well, really anyone can have that thought. Maybe if you have that thought and you're not a religious person, you say, well, I don't believe there's a hell, so therefore you dismiss it right off. Or even if you do, and you're a person of faith and you're a religious person, you may say, well, I, I have to have faith and trust in, in God or in, in, my, in the church or whatever it is that I'm going to be okay, that things are okay, right? Yeah. But you, so you kind of deal with it that way. But the person who becomes obsessed with that thought, of course, is saying, well, I need to know whether I'm condemned to hell. And so then they get caught because they can never really know. And so for something like that, you have to use more cognitive interventions of really helping the person uh, develop a different attitude and different approach to the thought. Often what we do now in OCD is we combine cognitive strategies with helping people learn to accept or tolerate distressing thoughts. Yeah. Right. And and so we add those particular strategies, let's say, to exposure and response prevention. And when you get a thought like a religious thought or a thought about a pet being a pedophile or whatever, those ones you often have to use more of the cognitive strategies for. Right. So could could you give an example of of how that would work with, for example, thinking that you're a pedophile or. So let's say that, um, yeah, so often when it comes to these uh, thoughts of being a pedophile, it's usually something like, um, well, there's two, two that I'm most familiar with. I've had several patients who have these. One is, have I touched a child uh, inappropriately? And the other one is, uh, am I sexually aroused by children in some way? Maybe they see a child. Uh, maybe yeah, I've, I've had patients even, you know, if there's a, they see a child on, 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 in a movie or television and they think, oh, did I find that little girl or little boy or whatever attractive? Or and was there some kind of arousal that happened within me? And does that mean that I'm a pedophile? Now, I've never done a crime, they'll say. I've never harmed a child, but could I? You know, it's the thought. It's imagining yeah. the possibility. And so in, in, in that case, what we do is we say, OK, that's a thought. OK, so how are you responding to that thought to create significance, to make it a significant thought? It's an unwanted intrusive thought. I, I would say many, many, maybe even most people have at some time in their life, they've had some kind of thought like that. And they go, "Ooh, wouldn't that be awful? Ooh, wouldn't that be horrible? Yeah. And you, know, you can't think of anything worse, really than harming a child. And so they kind of shudder and they think, ooh, that's a terrible thought. But then they put it out of their mind because 
you know, they're not going to do it. They, they decide right away. That's not significant because it's not me. I would never do it. I find it a horrific crime and they leave it at that. Yeah. But what happens in OCD is the person goes, hmm, how come that thought popped into my mind? Where did that come from? What does that mean about me? What if I lose control and actually do that? Wouldn't that be horrible and horrific? And that would make me such an evil person. And so you see, they're responding in a different way to the thought. And their way of responding makes it... um, they end up thinking the thought is much more important. And they say, well, I've got to stop thinking about that because if the more I think about it, maybe I'll actually do it. Yeah. And so now they're trying to push the thought out of their mind. And the more you try to tell yourself not to think about something, the more you're going to think about it. Exactly. Don't think about the pink elephant. Exactly. <laughs> right. And you will think about the pink elephant, although this is far, far worse than pink elephants, right? So... It's, it's, it's like, and so they, they're trying not to have the thought they're, they're, they're feeling terrible guilt. They're very worried about it, feeling anxious. And then of course the thought keeps popping in their mind more and more. And so they start avoiding kids and they won't, I've had patients who won't even watch movies if they think there's a child in the movie because it, you know, and So they're making a big, big deal out of this thought, whereas other people are saying, you know what, that's just a gross, stupid thought. I would never want to do that. I'm not that type of person. It's, you know, it's furthest from my mind. I can control myself. I, you know, and so they, it, it, it doesn't bother them. They just have it a few times and then that's it. It takes the power out of the thought kind of. It takes the power of the thought. And so this is what we're doing in therapy is really teaching the person how to normalize a distressing, an upsetting, even a repugnant, what we call repugnant intrusive thought. What what would be the best way to relate or to handle such a thought? Well, I mean, if you look at what, I, I mean, we all have these intrusive thoughts. We have, you know, and I've done research over the years on this, and these are people who do not have OCD. These are just, you know, university students and other people. They don't have any particular mental health problems. And if you ask them, well, have you ever had intrusive thoughts, you know, kind of like disgusting ones, like maybe, you know, having sex with an older person who you find disgusting, and they go, ooh, yeah, ooh, that would be awful. You know, the thought or the image popped in their mind and they just kind of shudder and they go away. I mean, so what they're doing is basically they're saying that's not a meaningful thought. That's just a stupid, silly thought. Yeah. And they get right on with their life. They keep, you know, they get back into whatever they're working on, their schoolwork, their their work at uh, their employment, uh, they end up talking to their partners or their friends and so on. They just get on with life, right? But what happens in OCD is the person gets stuck on the thought because they 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 overinterpret it. They overthink the thought. Yeah. So we all have intrusive thoughts. This is where we start. We say, this is what our brains do. Our brains are highly creative. It's always thinking. In fact, some of the neuroscience research says that the brain's default mode is what we call stimulus-independent thought, just random thoughts popping in our mind all the time. Yeah. You know? And so what happens is we just, as long as you don't consider them particularly meaningful or useful or important in any way, they just kind of float in, they just kind of pop in and then disappear and we're hardly even aware of them. But when you have a thought and you go, ooh, wait a minute. I often say to my patients, you get a ping. You know, you get like a click or something in your head and it goes, ooh, what's that? Where'd that come from? Yeah. You know, what does that mean? And so you start to build a significance uh, about the thought, the intrusive thought. Then it can escalate 
gets more and more frequent, more and more distressing, and then you start to develop other strategies. Then the compulsions kick in and other other strategies like thought to suppression uh, or reassurance seeking and so on. Right. And you get into this this very unhealthy cycle. Right. So it's it's really about like it's really about if you think it's um yeah, how how much power you give to the thought or what you think about the thought when you have it. And the more you think it's a really horrible thought that that it's it might be something wrong with you the more yeah so the more power you give to it the the more it will come back again right and it, it it's tough because some of these thoughts really are bad i mean harming a child is really bad running someone over with your car is really bad you know i mean these are not sometimes these are you know spreading you know terrible diseases uh, you know, to someone, to, you know, loved ones or your workmates or whatever. I mean, these are bad things. These are terrible things, right? So it's not like, they're not like pink elephants, right? Yeah. They're thoughts that we all find disturbing, but then it's say, okay, you know, it's normal to have unwanted, intrusive, disturbing thoughts, What's critical is what you do with those thoughts, how you respond to them, how you, and as you say, giving them power. Uh, but there's a way you give them power, is the way that you can strip away their power. In one of my books, I talk about making the thought toxic or making the detoxifying the thought. Right. What, what, right? What, what is the best way if you want to de detoxify a thought? So one of the best ways is, first of all, I guess you could say uh, a fairly um, kind of a, a multi-step approach would be to recognize, to be aware, to recognize that you've had the thought and then to realize that it is an unwanted intrusive thought. Yeah. And that's the big distinction. I think the problem is lots of times people with OC, with obsessions they end up going, oh, maybe I maybe I wanted to have that thought. And so maybe there's something terribly wrong with me or I'm an immoral person or an, I'm an evil person. So it's being able to recognize that we all have unwanted, intrusive thoughts. And sometimes these thoughts can be very, um, very upsetting. They can be even disgusting to us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, y you know, so that's the first. Then the second thing is to say, okay, how am I building this up in my mind to be significant? What am I telling myself about this thought? Am I overthinking it? Am I thinking that it means that I'm an evil person or I'm an Im immoral person or that I'm going to lose control or, you know, this sort of thing? Okay, so then you recognize how am I making it toxic and then you detoxify it by saying you know what um i'm convinced that i don't want to do this that i'm not going to do this but i'm not going to be afraid of having the thought yeah. and so sometimes what we actually do is what we call imaginal exposure where we actually ask our patients to set aside time every day where they actually purposefully think about it Right. Right. And so what you're doing is you're saying, I'm not afraid of this thought anymore. Hmm. Right. Right. So, so it's really about being aware of your thoughts and then being aware of how you, what you do when you get the thoughts. And then right. if you're not, if you're not acting in a, in a sufficient way, then it's for you to, to try to change how you react to the thought. Right. And a lot of it is we have to go in history. So as a, as a clinical psychologist, when I see someone for the first time, and let's say ha they have these uh, violent, aggressive, uh, sexual thoughts, uh, the first thing I have to do, of course, is an assessment and say, okay, is this the type of person who would do this? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And how we tell is from people's history, you know? I mean, there are 
there are people who do terrible things in this world and 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 they have the thoughts as well but they're acting on the thoughts right they're you know and so that's the first you know thing but most people know that i mean if you've never never harmed anyone and if in your in the ocd of course when people have harming obsessions they're very upset by it they're yeah. horrified because they don't want to harm people right exactly they're usually very gentle people they're respectful of other people uh and so um yeah so the thought is we call it in a prof- ego dystonic it's uncharacteristic of the type of person they are How, what does the science say about the effectiveness of um, changing how you relate to your thoughts. So um, there's a very good science now. There's a very uh, we've had decades of research, treatment outcome studies looking at exposure and response prevention. That's the very conventional standard that we descri- I described earlier. And you get approximately somewhere between sixty to seventy percent. Uh, uh, effectiveness, so significant reduction in symptoms when people complete, let's say, 15 to 20 sessions, right? Um, Now, most people do not end up symptom-free, so only about 25% will be symptom-free. So that means you're still going to have, you know, times, let's say, when you have the obsessive thought, you might even have times when you slip back into doing compulsions. But overall, and we've got outcome studies up to five years, and I think even there's been some ten year, uh, one or two 10-year studies that have showed that there can be long-term effectiveness with exposure mm-hmm. response prevention. And that seems to be the best, the be- best treatment. Medication can be helpful. Um, probably the medication is not quite as effective as exposure response prevention. So if you look at it and you say medication versus uh, no treatment at all, definitely medication is significantly better, Yeah, significantly effective. If you say medication versus uh, exposure response prevention, it seems like they're somewhat equivalent Although the expo- people who have had the exposure response prevention, their treatment gains last longer mm. than just medication. The problem with medication is you withdraw the medication often, you get a return of symptoms, yeah, okay. right? Okay. And it looks like that if you take the me- people with medication and you add in exposure and response prevention, they do better than medication alone. Right. And, and, and about the, is there any science also about, the um, I mean the the way you relate to to thoughts as well when it comes to OCD or otherwise. So if we talk about you know how you relate to the thoughts, uh, which we can call cognitive strategies, adding the cognitive strategies to exposure response prevention doesn't seem to add a whole lot. Okay. Okay. In other words, if you have the cognitive strategies plus the ERP versus people with just the ERP, the people with just the ERP seem to do just as well, pretty well as as those with the cognitive strategies plus ERP. But the problem with that, a lot of those studies are based on a mixed OCD sample. And so if you look at the sample, most people will have had um, you know, uh, washing and, and checking, let's say, compulsions, which uh, because they're anchored in real life, mm. ERP, exposure response prevention, is going to be more effective for them. Then when you start looking at people who have the more abstract obsessions, like what we some in some places that in the internet they call it pure obsessions or pure O, then the cognitive strategies may be more more helpful and even more necessary. Right. So um, it depends on the type of OCD, I guess. And there's a new, uh, 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 Professor Rackman and his colleagues have been studying uh, something called um, moral uh, or mental contamination. And that is where the person feels 
contaminated inside. So it's not a physical contaminant like dirt and contamination, but it's like a moral contamination. Mm, okay. All right. Yeah. So so that's pretty interesting. So but to summarize, so so the two biggest two best things when it comes to to OCD, then it's first is this ERP it's to be exposed for the things that are uncomfortable for you and then not being able to do your compulsions. And then you all, we also have these cognitive strategies, which is more how you relate to the thoughts. So getting aware of the thoughts, getting aware of how you respond to the thoughts and then responding in a different way. Right. And often what, what I do in my work my practice and actually when I'm I'm writing about this what I tend to recommend and many of my colleagues as well is you start out with some of the cognitive strategies even with people with let's say physical contamination or checking because you're kind of building up their resources and some coping strategies before they do the really hard work which is the exposure and response prevention and there's I mean at least clinically we think that there is some benefit to that that people you know it's kind of like the old adage of you know if you can't swim do you throw somebody in the deep end <laughs> with sharks <laughs> you know, with the sharks exactly yeah or you start out you know in the in the shallow end let's say and gradually move in and so some of these cognitive strategies are kind of like starting out in the shallow end getting some understanding your ocd better understanding why, you know, you've had, why it's so distressing, why it's so persistent, how you might be able to think about this fear of your thoughts in a different way, tone down the significance of it. And then, uh, you're, you know, once you've made some gains in that, then proceeding to the exposure response prevention, which is really hard. I mean, there's no question about it. It's it's tough facing one's fear, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I was also, I'm having just one last question also, which uh, just um, which I'm just curious about. Uh, that is about the, being aware of your thoughts, because it's it's quite hard, I think, to always be aware of what you're thinking. It's more that you're pretty much one with your thought so do you have yeah. like any tips of good ways of getting aware of your thoughts as you're having them so uh, and I, I mean that's a great question but here's the thing in ocd the thing is people are hyper aware of ah thought, yeah true yeah right yeah true. they're 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 so locked into what they're thinking um that that becomes a problem for them um, so they can't stop thinking about their thoughts right they're overthinkers i often use this term overthinkers and uh, most people with ocd know exactly what i'm saying they go oh yeah i'm an overthinker <laughs> yeah you know because they're saying okay where did that thought come from what does it mean why did i have it I've got to get rid of it because I'm worried something terrible is going to happen. I'm going to lose control. I'm going to harm other people. I'm going to do something that will ruin the rest of my life and so on. So they're paying way too much attention to these thoughts. Right. 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 Yeah, that's true. Yeah. David, it's been a it's been really interesting talking to you and learning more about OCD and learning about ways that we can treat and also strategies I think that all of us listening can use in our everyday lives, even if we have a clinical OCD or not. So I would just yeah. I would like to say a big, big thank you for taking part. And I would also like to mention uh, your book, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for OCD and its subtype. So if somebody wants to learn more it's i think it's a very good very good book to 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 take a look at to to learn some more As, uh, and it was been a great pleasure uh, speaking with you andre if i might mention that book that you refer to is more of a kind of a clinician book and if it's uh if you're kind of um you know either you're struggling with ocd yourself or you know you have a family or friend i've written a book called the anxious thoughts workbook which really um, um, describe some of the strategies, the cognitive strategies we were talking about today and and kind of might be more appropriate for people, I think, unless they are a mental health professional. Very good. That's a that's a great, great addition to what I just, I just said. Thank you for that. 
Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, David. And thank you, Andre. It was a pleasure talking to you about this uh, subject that is uh, so important to so many people. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Friends, I really need your help. I'm trying to get the podcast out there. So I was wondering if you could help me by leaving a positive rating and a review on your Apple device or the podcast player that you're using, as well as subscribing to the podcast. That really helps getting the show more visible on iTunes and other players. And if you don't know how it's done, then YouTube has a lot of great videos, so you can search there. All right, that's it. Take care. (laughs) 